From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! Until victory forever, let's go to the streets to defend this victory, to defend the triumph, in peace, and in order to celebrate with the people, and to remember that we have complied with the commander. Chavez, I swear to you, we have fulfilled your promise for independence and a socialist fatherland. The late Hugo Chavez's chosen successor, Nicolás Maduro, has won in Venezuela's closest presidential election in more than 40 years. But his challenger is calling for a recount. I want to say to the government's candidate, the loser today is you. And I say that firmly. You are the loser. You and your government. We'll host a discussion on the election and the future of Venezuela after the death of Hugo Chavez. Then, as millions of Americans file their income taxes today, we'll speak with one who won't, Ed Hedeman. He helped start the National War Tax Resistance Coordinating Committee. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Nicolás Maduro has won Venezuela's presidential election more than a month after the death of Hugo Chávez. Maduro, who was Chávez's chosen successor, narrowly defeated opposition candidate Enrique Capriles Radansky, just over 50 percent of—with just over 50 percent of the vote. Capriles has refused to concede the race and is demanding a recount, according to preliminary figures that turn out of registered voters surpassed 78 percent. We'll have more on Venezuela after headlines. Guards at the Guantanamo Bay military prison have intensified their crackdown on a hunger strike by prisoners. The Pentagon says guards fired non-lethal rounds at prisoners Saturday after trying to move them into isolated one-man cells. At least one prisoner was hit with a rubber-coated bullet. The military claims it took action after prisoners covered windows and surveillance cameras. It also says prisoners used improvised weapons to resist the guards' sweep. Defense attorneys say most of the prison 166 prisoners are now taking part in the hunger strike two months after it began. At least 11 prisoners are being force-fed through nasal tubes. The latest unrest came one day after the International Committee of the Red Cross wrapped up a three-week visit to assess the prisoners' treatment. In an opinion piece published in The New York Times, Samir Najia Hassan Mokbe, a hunger-striking prisoner held at Guantanamo for 10 years without charge, writes, Quote, the situation is desperate now. All of the detainees here are suffering deeply, and there's no end in sight to our imprisonment. Denying ourselves food and risking death every day is the choice we have made. I just hope that because of the pain we are suffering, the eyes of the world will once again look at Guantanamo before it is too late, he wrote. The Senate is set to take up gun control legislation today after voting to begin debate. The proceedings follow a week of Capitol Hill lobbying by family members of victims of the shooting massacre at Newtown, Connecticut's Sandy Hook Elementary. On Saturday, Newtown mother Francine Wheeler, who lost six-year-old son Ben, delivered President Obama's weekly address. I've heard people say that the tidal wave of anguish our country felt on 1214 has receded. But not for us. To us, it feels as if it happened just yesterday. And in the four months since we lost our loved ones, thousands of other Americans have died at the end of a gun. Thousands of other families across the United States are also drowning in our grief. Please help us do something before our tragedy becomes your tragedy. Secretary of State John Kerry has wrapped up a visit to Asia, dominated by the standoff with North Korea. Speaking in Japan, Kerry suggested the U.S. could ease its precondition of North Korea's denuclearization if China takes on a mediator role. Earlier, Kerry again vowed to defend U.S. allies in the event of a North Korean attack. And it is very simple that the United States will do what is necessary to defend our allies, Japan, the Republic of Korea, and the region against these provocations. But our choice is to negotiate. Our choice is to move to the table and find a way for the region to have peace. <clears throat> 
Kerry's visit also came as the Obama administration fast-tracked Japanese involvement in talks on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a controversial trade pact between the U.S. and nine other countries. The TPP has attracted scrutiny for creating new mechanisms that would allow foreign corporations to win taxpayer compensation for lost profits due to regulations. Japan has more corporations operating in the U.S. than other TPP countries, raising the prospect of compensation claims. In a statement, the group Public Citizen said, quote, by inviting Japan to enter the TPP negotiations, the Obama administration is inviting a wave of corporate attacks on domestic laws through a dom system that is a threat to our sovereignty and solvency. A former Texas court official has been arrested in connection with the murders of two prosecutors and the district attorney's wife. Eric Williams, a former justice of the peace in Kaufman County, was detained Saturday after police searched his home in their probe of last month's killings of district attorney Mike McClelland and Cynthia McClelland, as well as of assistant prosecutor Mark Haas, two months before public speculation had initially focused on white supremacists. But local police say they found strong evidence in implicating Williams in the murders. Hassey and McClelland had prosecuted Williams last year after he was caught stealing computer equipment. North Dakota lawmakers have advanced new restrictions on abortion rights. The North Dakota State House voted Friday to outlaw abortions after 20 weeks of pregnancy, which anti-choice activists believe marks the point at which a fetus can feel pain. The vote comes weeks after North Dakota Governor Jack Dalrymple signed a measure banning abortion once an embryonic heartbeat is detectable, which can happen at six weeks of pregnancy or even earlier. The Virginia Board of Health, meanwhile, signed off on new regulations that could force the closure of some of the state's abortion clinics, a 2011 measure dubbed by critics as a targeted regulation of abortion providers, or TRAP law, requires clinics that provide abortions to meet the same building standards as hospitals. Critics say the TRAP rules are a thinly veiled attempt to limit access to abortion services because clinics unable to afford to overhaul their buildings would close down. Other states have imposed similar regulations, but Virginia's are said to be the harshest to date. The former head of the Virginia Board of Health, Dr. Karen Remley, resigned in protest of the clinic rules last year. The Environmental Protection Agency has confirmed plans to delay the first-ever limits on greenhouse gas emissions from new power plants. The rules would have forced new power plants to keep emissions under 1,000 pounds of carbon dioxide for every megawatt hour of electricity. They were unveiled a year ago and set for a finalization over the weekend. But on the eve of the deadline, the EPA said opposition from electric power companies would delay the rules' implementation. While energy companies and Republican critics said the rules went too far, environmentalists had also criticized the plan for exempting existing plants and allowing a number of loopholes. A standoff between the U.S. and Russia has intensified, with both countries announcing travel bans on certain officials. The White House has sent Congress a list of Russians subject to visa denials and asset freezes in the U.S. for their alleged involvement in the death of imprisoned whistleblower Sergei Magnitsky. Russia responded by banning the entry of a number of U.S. officials, including former Bush administration attorney John Yoo and David Addington, chief of staff to former Vice President Dick Cheney. White House Press Secretary Jay Carney defended the administration's action. Russian officials implicated directly in Magnitsky's imprisonment and prison officials directly involved in decisions that led to his death remain unpunished. Uh, this administration is committed to working with the Congress to advance universally recognized human rights worldwide, and we will use the tools in the Magnitsky Act and other available legal authorities to ensure that persons responsible for the maltreatment and death of Mr. Magnitsky are barred from traveling to the United States and doing business here. A Florida police officer has been fired for using the likeness of Trayvon Martin as a target in gun practice. Sergeant Ron King of the Port Canaveral Police reportedly offered the targets with Trayvon's face to two other officers and a civilian who all declined. Trayvon Martin was the unarmed African-American teenager shot to death by self-proclaimed neighborhood watchman George Zimmerman last year. John Walsh of Port Canaveral apologized to Trayvon's family. We truly reach out and apologize to the family of Trayvon Martin uh, for them needing to, you know, hear any of this and, and the grief that it must bring them, as well as all members of the community, that, that we just don't find uh, this behavior acceptable on any level. 
The fired officer, Ron King, has apologized, claiming Trayvon's target was meant as a do-not-shoot target. The trial of Trayvon's killer, George Zimmerman, is set to begin in two months. A Tennessee Republican lawmaker has withdrawn a measure that would have cut the welfare benefits of parents whose children receive low grades. State Senator Stacey Campfield had proposed a 30 percent cut to temporary assistance for needy families' benefits for parents whose children fail to pass state tests or are held back a grade level. The proposal sparked controversy and national media attention. Campfield backed down on the proposal just hours after he was confronted by a group of protesters inside the the state capitol, including an eight-year-old girl who followed him down a hallway after presenting him with a petition in opposition to his bill. The Republican lawmaker who revealed portions of a classified Pentagon report on North Korea last week has acknowledged he was motivated by seeking to increase funding for so-called missile defense. Congressmember Doug Lamborn of Colorado made headlines last week after citing a defense intelligence agency document that concluded with moderate confidence North Korea now knows how to make a nuclear weapon small enough to be carried by a ballistic missile. Top U.S. officials later cast doubt on the report, but not before it caused a stir. Speaking on CNN, Lambord said he hoped to restore missile defense funding cut by President Obama. And the reason I'm concerned about this is because the president has offered a defense budget that cuts missile defense by half a billion dollars. My goal in all this is by calling attention to the potential threats that we restore those dollars. And hundreds of people marched in Washington, D.C. for the first-ever K Street 5K protest against money and politics. Participants wore costumes of $100 bills to march from the lobbyist stronghold of K Street to the U.S. Capitol. The rally brought together progressive activists with groups including the D.C. Tea Party Patriots. One of the organizers, the group Represent.us, said the rally marked the launch of a, quote, a powerful movement of grassroots progressives and conservatives who are building a new, robust anti-corruption movement in the United States. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now!, your daily independent global news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.